following interview was conducted with Jack Arlen Young, class of 1958, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, April the 27th, 2009, in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Also sitting in is a colleague, Francis James. Thank you. Welcome. And thank you. Okay. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. I drew, grew up in Noble County near Albion, Indiana. Uh, my father was a rural letter carrier for 33 years. Uh, my mother was a beautician, but somehow or other wound up as the secretary to the principal in the high school forever, it seemed. Um, I graduated from Albion High School. What was grade school like? But, uh is it a small school? Or? Yeah, it's a small school. Okay. There were 43 kids in the, my high school graduating class, so you can understand the classes below that weren't much larger. <laughs> you know. Any activities in high school, at student organizations, or anything you participated in? Oh, all of it. Uh, choir, uh, school plays, uh, basketball, baseball. That kept me pretty busy. Right, yeah, right. Yeah. Was school close to where you lived? Uh, three houses. Oh, wow. <laughs> so you went home for lunch, right? I could, yes. <laughs> Did most of the time. Sure. Do you have any bro any siblings, brothers or sisters? I have a brother that's nine years younger that's deceased. Okay. And uh, it was a kind of an awkward thing in the uh, jumping ahead here because of activities here at Purdue, I didn't get home on many weekends, and uh, therefore I didn't get to see many of the activities that he was involved in. So we were never really close. Uh, uh, I was gone when he was in high school and that kind of a thing. Because of the time, the age span. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we, we were brothers, but we really didn't know each other. <laughs> <laughs> what about military school? Uh, next is college then. Uh, how did well, you, you came to Purdue? How did you have to select Purdue? <laughs> well, it was kind of ironic. I had planned to go to Notre Dame. And uh, one of my classmates in high school, um, his uncle was a Purdue graduate and a rabid fan. And he lived in Fort Wayne. And this friend, Alex Larson, deceased now, uh, he invited me to come along for the weekend, and or the, the day, really. So <clears throat> I came down, and I was very impressed with Purdue. I'd been all over the Notre Dame campus, and I thought the Purdue campus was much nicer. And uh, we started home. Did you come for a football weekend or no? Just, or just a just weekend. Just a day. Day. Okay. Just a Saturday. Drove down on Saturday morning and we started home, and got in a horrendous snowstorm. Um, finally made it to Fort Wayne by letting most of the air out of all of the tires, so we had some traction. And uh, my dad then finally was able to come to Fort Wayne and pick me up on Monday. Uh, wow but we had a place to sleep in Fort Wayne. And I thought, well, maybe that's where I'm supposed to be going. <laughs> I don't know. The snowstorm. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, yeah, it was a real blizzard. So, and I came in the fall of 52. And... Um, what was campus like when you came? Did you well, live in a residence hall? No. Oh. I lived with Ma Lowe over on Waldron Street. Louis Lowe was her son. And Louis Lowe was the president of the Board of Trustees at the time. Uh, nice guy. And um, we, my college roommate, Don Powell, was a farmer kid from over on Greentown. And so that's where we hooked up together, and we've been friends ever since. 
Uh, was this a, 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 in a house? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. There were nine of us. Oh, you had the whole house? Well, no. Oh. She rented the rooms out, and she rode herd on the whole group and did a good job. <laughs> Little old bitty thing, you know, puff of wind would blow her away, but she... She ran the shop. She ran the store. There's no question about it. And uh, her husband was a neat old guy. He was a shoe salesman. And she wouldn't allow any smoking or any drinking in the house. Well, it was fine with those of us living there. So Pablo, uh, he always had a bottle hit out in the garage, and he'd go out in the garage and smoke a little bit and have a snort or two. <laughs> Working in the yard, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you need a little spirits when you're working out in the yard. Yeah. <clears throat> so then I, I guess from that point on, I tried out for the glee club and was selected, and I played baseball here. Um, what position did you play? A pitcher. Okay. Where was the baseball field? Was um, it Stewart Field? Or no? Well, almost. Okay. Yeah, Hank Stram was the coach. Of the baseball? Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Didn't know diddly squat about baseball, but he was the assistant football coach, one of the assistant football coaches, and the procedure back then was that they always gave the assistant football coaches some kind of an extra coaching job so that it increased their pay scale. Uh, and he took baseball, or was given baseball, and because of that, Red Mackey and I became lifelong friends. Uh, because he made the mistake of asking me one day, Red did, uh, Hank know anything about baseball? And I said, no, nope. not the first thing about it. <laughs> and I had played in Legion ball and semi-pro ball and stuff like that. And so I had a little bit of an understanding of it. And, uh, but it was fun. We got through there and the Glee Club was who is the uh, Al Stewart? Al Stewart. Yeah. Right. Uh, he uh, ran a tight ship, but accomplished great things for the university that I don't think the university ever really. Under Fred Hovde did. But I'm not sure that there were many, and maybe uh, it was the dean of students. Uh, shoot, lived up on Grant Street. That's okay. I can't think of his name right now. It'll come to me eventually. And um, in the summertime, I worked as a section hand on the B&O Railroad and uh, made good money. Probably should have stayed there. <laughs> so uh, the, the whole summer, was uh, repairing rail, basically. And they would bring a group of Gandhi dancers down from Chicago, and, and they would park their two or three cars on a siding way out in the country so that there was no way they could get into town. They were all black folks. And uh, there were some nice people in that bunch, too. Did they work on the railroad too? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, one, I never knew his name other than Booker. And one summer, Booker taught me how they illegally spiked. Uh, they would spike across the rail, and that was a no-no. And they accomplished that by cutting a foot off the end of the mall, so that you just dip your shoulder and come again, and if you missed a lick, get out of the road, because the next one's gonna be right in the back of your head. Because it only took three strokes to drive the spike in. And Booker and I spiked 14 miles double rail both ways that summer. Had a lot of muscles. They're all gone now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, came back here in the, should have come back, I should have graduated in, in the 56, 
but I met this lady that I thought I couldn't live without and uh, met her playing semi-pro baseball. She came to the stadium and kept bothering me and <laughs> the shortstop wanted to know if I wanted to go to the county fair with the gal that was coming to see him play. And I said, I got nothing else to do. And he said, well, we'll take this other gal along with us. Now you have to understand that it was a very hot night. Um, I wore um, three-quarter length wool shirt when I pitched. And as long as I was on a winning streak, I would not wash that shirt under that it was my good luck shirt. Well, I had seven wins in a row going into that night and I won that game, so that was eight. I don't imagine she appreciated the smell, but <laughs> she went along with it. She went along with it, yeah. Sorry. Right. <laughs> so the upshot of that was then I had to come back in the fall and graduate midterm. And I don't think of myself as a 58 graduate. Uh, I think of myself as a 56 graduate. That's where all my friends were. And, uh, what what uh, program what, uh, was your course of studies? And did you live in that same house the whole time you were here? No, oh. no. Um, I lived down on South Street, the first house beyond the Methodist Church that they tore down. Uh, Around the hill? Or south, or south, further down? South. Mm, Is well, it in Lafayette? Yeah, oh, okay. right down here, the, the Methodist Church that they tore down. So there was a house behind that, on that, whatever that street is, I've forgotten. Mm -hmm. And that's where I lived. And uh, I really had no minors. I had three majors. I had a major in physical education, a major in recreation, and a ma major in secondary education. And uh, Somehow I managed to get through all of that and survived, mm -hmm. and uh, it worked out well. Uh, but when I left here, well, actually that last semester, I worked at Logan Sports State Hospital in the recreation department, and I drove back and forth during the summer school. And uh, I could leave up there at six o'clock and be here for 7.30 class. And the class was over at 9.30 and be back in Logansport in 45 minutes and that kind of thing. So that's, that's good driving. <laughs> yeah, there was not much traffic at that point in time. Uh, so anyway, we, we did that and uh, managed to get all of that under our belts. And then I was offered a job in Toledo, Ohio, as the associate director of a settlement house, North Toledo Community House. And uh, it was right in the middle of a, it wasn't subsidized housing because it had a, a local owner, but there were about 40 some houses that surrounded the community house there. and. Uh, we had an apartment in the community house, and that was an interesting experience to say the least. Uh, but we had, uh, at that point in time, we had two children, uh, a boy and then a girl. And uh, my wife was a little hesitant about um, taking the kids outside. It was a rough neighborhood, there's no getting around it. So she didn't, and uh, there was a fenced-in yard, and uh, I had some beagle hounds, and they were very protective of the children. So she got the point of feeling comfortable about being outside there. And then, I don't know how this happened. Uh, I received a call from uh, a guy who was the associate director of boys clubs of Milwaukee. And he flew down to Toledo 
and what they wanted me to do was to come up and take over uh, all the camps that the boys clubs have in the United States. But they wanted me to be housed in Milwaukee because the Milwaukee Boys Club had five camps in the state. So we elected to do that and, and that was a good experience. And things were fine there and um, then I was approached by uh, some councilmen from Michigan City, Indiana and they wanted me to come down there and become superintendent of parks and recreation. So I did that for a couple of years. And uh, during that time frame, I brought the Glee Club up to Michigan City to put on a concert in the, the uh, high school. And um, Al, I guess, must have liked what he saw because um, maybe he figured I had grown up. Al and I did not often see eye to eye. <laughs> and, and I was one of the few people, I guess, who had enough intestinal fortitude to tell him <laughs> that I didn't agree. You know? so, uh, so he called and wanted to know, wanted to know if I'd come down and talk to him. So I did. And he offered me the job of uh, publicity promotions and public relations for victory varieties. So I told my wife, Judy, uh, I said, okay, well, we're going to make one more move. And then that's it. We're going to give these kids a chance to put down roots because up to now they haven't had that opportunity. So um, we moved down here and uh, what year was that? I think 1964 or five. Yeah, right? something like that. Where, where did you live when you came here then? Uh, out on 400 West. Okay. Um, kids went to Klondike School. And. Uh, by that time, there, there were three of them, uh, Jay, Jana, and Jed. Um, Jay has been an athletic trainer and in sports medicine in San Antonio for 29 years. Uh, Jana is in higher education primarily uh, taking care of the tendons, but her, she's pretty talented. She didn't get it from her dad, I can tell you that. Um, she does a lot of commercials. She does a lot of Broadway shows in the Seattle area where she lives in Seattle. Uh, and she has two children, uh, one which has graduated from Wazoo, which is Washington State University, and the other is uh, at the University of Idaho in theater arts, and she's got some of her mother's singing abilities. So, uh, and the youngest boy is a professor at uh, Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, and. Uh, He's uh, in the uh, what is it? Horticulture. Yeah, it's horticulture, but it's uh, he specializes. He's right now he's specializing in bringing the uh, American chestnut back to life, and he's having some success in doing that. Mm -hmm. He's crossed it with the Chinese chestnut. And that makes it resistant to all the junk bugs that killed it off yeah. originally. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, Did any of the children go to Purdue? All three of them. Okay. No, they had a choice. Uh, they used to like to kid me. Uh, Sunday dinner, one of them started in the 
you know, Dad, uh, I think I'd like to go to law school. I understand that Notre Dame has a good law school. And the daughter chimes in, well, I, you know, I want to follow my uh, theater career. And I understand that, that uh, they have an excellent one in Indiana. And uh, the third one is ducking to get under the table because he knows somebody's going to get one right in the chops. <laughs> I didn't say a word other than I just sat back and said, well, if that's where you want to go and that's what you want to do, that's fine. I just want you to know you're out of the will. <laughs> and that ended all the discussion about going someplace else. <laughs> took a second look. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but they all graduated from here. Jay got his physical therapy here, and Jenna got her theater arts here, and <coughs> Jed got his horticulture here. Mm -hmm. Were you good. Did you ever, uh, were you ever in the service at all? Mm -hmm. No, military service. Okay. Well, let's talk, talk a little bit about your uh, experiences at Purdue, and were you, were you the advisor for Grand Prix at one time? Or? Well, yeah, let me back up before okay. that, if you don't right. mind. Yeah. Uh, I always enjoyed being around and working with students. And uh, over the course of my time here, I inherited Grand Prix because Grand Prix was solely supported by the Purdue Alumni Scholarship Foundation, which was Cordy Hall, and then Cordy retired and Dick Thornton took over. And Dick didn't want to have that kind of an association with the students. Uh, so I was informed that I was taking that over and did and enjoyed it. I also took was the faculty advisor of the Purdue crew Boilermaker tractor pull, I helped start. Um, Grand Prix was five. Yeah. Oh, volunteer uh, core thing where the uh, girls would call up and somebody would walk them to classes at night, that volunteer group. And uh, where were you uh, affiliated? Where were you located then? Were you with the athletic so or the alumni association? Mm -hmm. Okay. But what happened to the musical? So, uh, you know, when you came down to work with Al Stewart. Well, I worked. Uh, in their promotions. Yeah. And for Victor Varieties. Well, I I worked there until 1969, and Cordy Hall went to Al and said that he was retiring and that he would like to have me come over and become the associate director because Thornton was going to move up and take his spot. And amazingly enough, Al agreed to that. Now, he and Cordy were good friends, so maybe that helped him. Mm -hmm. So that's when I got out of, I had some great, great times and because uh, I'll give you a couple of things. Uh, one of my favorites was Della Reese, and she had flown in here from California, got stuck in O'Hara, went to the Butler Aviation, rented a plane to fly, fly her down here, and I was in contact with the people out here at the airport, so I knew where she was and when she was going to be on the ground. And uh, the plane taxied up right in front of the the airport there and the door flew open and she threw her suitcase down the steps and I grabbed the suitcase and started putting it in the car or in the trunk and she said no put that in the back seat so I put it in the back seat and now I'm driving up I don't know it must have been about a 64 rambler of some sorts four door and she said, how far is it to the music hall? And I said, oh, it's a little less than three miles. She said, okay, you adjust your rearview mirror so you can't see what's going on back here. 
And when I pulled up the driveway into the green room there on the back, she got out in the door for her and she got out fully dressed, ready to go on stage. She changed all her clothes in the back seat of my car. <laughs> and then I took her to the football game and that one was that was when Leroy Keys was doing all the things, you know. And she got excited about Leroy in the first half. In the second half she really got excited about him because she didn't holler, give the ball to Leroy. She said, give the ball to God. <laughs> and she was, I remember that. I was at those games when he played, give the ball to Leroy. I mean, we did that a lot. <laughs> you know, she, she was very vocal about Leroy. <laughs> and then she asked if I could get in touch with him, and I said, I can try. So after he had time to get home, I called his room and thank goodness he was there along with a girlfriend and another player and his girlfriend and I said can you come over to the music hall Della Reese would like to meet you well yeah I guess he could but he had these other I said bring him along she won't mind so he did and they went in her dressing room and talked for two and a half hours and then she took him to dinner. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, we've never talked about this, but I'm sure that if you talk to Leroy today, he remembered <laughs> that night. The, Probably would, yeah. You know, <laughs> right. Um, I have a question about, I'm thinking of the research, the Victory Varieties. Just, just make a comment. Those were home football games, weekends, Fridays and Saturdays. Two shows each night. Right. For the researchers, they're no longer, haven't been for a long time. They don't have them anymore. No, that's unfortunate. Too. Oh, and then I, I enjoyed Henry Mancini. I had a great time with Henry Mancini. And uh, it was always my job to take the people to the football game if they wanted to go. Well, somebody dropped the ball and didn't tell Henry that. Uh, he was invited to go to the ball game, and most people didn't know it, but he did most of his recording, most of his records were made in Indianapolis, and he had the, I thought I could name the hotel, but he rented the penthouse in that hotel year round because he was here often making records. So I went back to uh, the music hall, I always walked from the stadium back to music hall because he either had to go pick up the Jack Benny's and the, well the only biggie that never was here was Bing Crosby and he didn't come because we weren't a Catholic school. And that's the only reason he didn't come. Hmm. Um, he had Pablo. Yes, three times. Um, I was there for years. <laughs> I was usually given the checks to give to the performers. And for that weekend, we paid Bob Hope $40,000. And he brought with him, anytime he came in to the Chicago area, he had this little old sharp dresser, but just four foot ten, maybe. And he was the guy that had started Hope in Vaudeville in Chicago. And so he always let Charlie, I don't know his last name, uh, book his shows so he did the thing well I was having trouble with him that night because he also bought, uh, invited a bunch of his uh, road show buddies from Chicago down and they went out to uh, Sarge Bills for supper and they got so engrossed in what they were doing they nearly forgot to come back and I'm holding the show uh, now that wasn't a displeasurable thing because Lenny Kazan was, <laughs> uh, but um, he was 20 minutes late, you know, and I was all over him when he came through the door. And later, and I'll tell you the later story. Uh, came time to pay him, Charlie 
is standing behind him, this little old guy from Chicago. And uh, of course, he had to sign for it for the check, and he signed for the check and just reached over his shoulder and said, here, Charlie, Merry Christmas. Gave Charlie $40,000, just that quick. <laughs> so, two or three, four years after that, I was on an airplane going from Houston to Ontario Airport. And when I got on the plane, Hope was sitting there. Uh, and as I walked by him, he reached out and took a hold of my arm and pulled me into the seat. And he said, aren't you the guy that chewed my ass in the music hall at Purdue for being late? I said, yes, sir, that's me. He said, you did the right thing. I knew better than that. I'm glad that somebody had the backbone to take me to task for it. So, and I was surprised I was going to remember it. <laughs> dummy like me three years later, but he did, okay. you know. So. But there were some great times with those people. I love the Baja Marimba band. You know. yeah, he had some good programs, because it was going on when I came. Yeah. Well, I move on to, so he moved over to the Alumni Association? Yeah, and that's where I got tied up with Grand Prix and the four other organizations. It was the year, the first year for Grand Prix, was it 58 or 57? Well, that's a bone of contention among uh, There's a group of individuals who are trying to say that they started it, and I'm saying, no, you didn't. The start came from Fred Hubby, and how that all came about was that we had Korean War veterans coming back to GI Bill. And they all had, compared to the rest of us, a lot of money. <coughs> and so they were buying 56 and 57 year uh, Chevrolets. And that was a hot car, that was a muscle car. <coughs> and then of course on Friday nights, being vets, they always had to go down and make sure that Harry's was still open for business. And eventually someone would say, my Chevy can beat your Chevy, and down to the North River Road they go. There were three accidents that year, killed three people. Um, there was old trees out there, didn't give much, you know. <coughs> so <clears throat> I was an Iron Key, and President Hovde, that was his own personal student organization. I don't know whether it still is that way or not, but it was then. He always met with us. Uh, he'd set up the meetings. We'd use it. Was, uh, it was his office, and then there was a conference room behind his office that most people didn't even know about. Well, that's where we always met about 8 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, so he knew the background, and I had a background of, of racing in the summertime. Uh, I would worked in the pit crew for Andy Granatelli and things like that at the 500. And based on that, he wanted my thoughts on what could we do to stop people racing up and down River Road. And uh, said then, what about go-karts? And from that grew Grand Prix. Uh, now the people that are attempting to take credit for it did build the first cart. But the idea came from Fred Hovde, not from their little fraternity group. They're having a hard time dealing with that, but uh, that's the way it goes. And the first one was run in what we used to be known as, which is now Engineering Mall, but it was in front of what's now Hubby Hall, is that correct? That's is the that? second one. Oh, the second one. Who was the first one run? Over Co-Rec. Where the Co-Rec is today? Yeah. Okay. We're through the parking lot. And then the second one was they went to the Le Mans start, so they backed the carts up all the way around the fountain. And the drivers had to stand on the other side of the road, and when somebody shot the gun, they had to run over, get in their cart, and go and 
We went around the engineering mall and all the things. Um, <laughs> there were some pretty, pretty pitiful looking cars made out of bed rails and wood frames, you know. And I can't remember his name, but he was, he was over at engineering uh, for years and years and years and years. And he was about five foot six and probably weighed 280 pounds. And he, he was the guy that inspected the frames. And his inspection process was he'd stand up in the driver's seat and jump up and down if it didn't break it fast. Harold Montgomery. Oh. That's who it was, Harold Montgomery. Yeah, yeah. Oh. So then I just was around and around and around the Grand Prix for, I don't know, I thought it was 25 years. I heard somebody say it was 30 the other day. I don't know. I was a faculty advisor a long time. Okay. And I liked that those, those people were, all of those Grand Prix senior boards, I always said were just like my kids. What was the Grand Prix Foundation? Was that started at the time that the Grand Prix started? No. Oh. Uh, it came about in 1966 because the uh, there had some minor associations existed with the, the Purdue Auto Club, but they were in the process of dying. The Auto Club? The Auto Club, yeah. And uh, so they needed something else, and I'm sure it was Cordy Hall who said, we'll take them under our wing. And they created a foundation that was the Grand Prix Foundation and still exists. Right. Uh, now we've started a new thing just this weekend. Um, there is now a I get the title right here. Uh, Purdue Grand Prix Alumni Organization. And through research and searching and this and that and the other, we've discovered over 6,000 graduates who listed on their resume cards that they had been affiliated with Grand Prix in one form or another. Um, and it was important that all of those people be invited what do we have, 100 this weekend? About that. Uh, passed the bylaws and stuff. Uh, there's a group of, what is it, eight, nine of us on Sunday nights? Yes, nine of us. Yeah, every Sunday night we've had conference calls for over a year with those people, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, trying to work out all the details. And, We've got them from coast to coast, border to border. Uh, so if this thing takes off and grows like I'm hopeful that it will, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be another organization that Purdue, I don't, know, I don't understand this, I didn't understand it in my 25, 30 years as faculty advisor, but there has always been a group of people in the administration who, for whatever reason, didn't care for Grand Prix. And they've done everything under the sun to try to kill it. So far, they haven't succeeded. As long as I'm alive, they won't. When did, did it stay in that um, mall in front of Pope Day, which is now the engineering mall? When did it, that was it when Dr. Hansen came? Is that when it went to the Grand Prix or was located no. there in Cherry Lane? Oh, no. after the mall, where, where was it run? The parking lot, football, stadium parking lot, Cherry Lane up there. Oh, that's what I said, in that, in that area yeah, there. Yeah, but not that track. Oh. 
Just that, in the parking lot. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. That track came about in. Uh, Dick Thornton built that track for them in uh, 1967. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. And uh, then. For research, it's just North, um, Northwestern and Cherry Lane. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then Joe Tiller needed another practice field, and then he left. And uh, Morgan had other ideas and plans for that, so they built the track, which in time may be okay. Right now it's in the middle of nowhere, nearly impossible to get to, especially if it rains. <laughs> and, uh, but we'll see how that goes. And, uh, what, uh you down. You stayed in development. You stayed with the alumni association, and then did you no, leave? No, oh. I went. I went from there uh, mainly because uh, Bering came on board, and he had a, in my opinion, a wee bit of greed in his soul, and he wanted to take over the uh, alumni scholarship foundation because we had about six million dollars in there that he thought he could better spend on himself a helicopter or something. I don't know what he had. And uh, so when they did away with that, he moved me over to Bugdy Hall. And it was kind of interesting. I was never was sure whether I was being spied upon or being a referee because my office sat between Beering's office and Chuck Wise's office. And I didn't know where, who was gonna open the door first to come bursting in and say, ooh, you know. I'm here. <laughs> yeah. So I was there for about two years and said that's enough. And then I started my own little consulting business. And uh, what I was doing was screening applicants for small colleges, presidencies, chancellors, vice chancellors. And basically that's how I wound up in Superior. When the, now did you leave the university and set up your own company? Or yeah. It's only, I mm -hmm. see, okay. I left here in 86. Okay. Uh, it was enough was enough, kind of a thing. And I went up to Superior. They had sent me the list of the people that had applied and I had screened those and sent back three names that I thought they might want to talk to. And uh, went up there, met with their faculty group in the morning and their foundation group in the afternoon and flew back to West Lafayette that evening. It was a Monday. And on a Wednesday, the chancellor up there, she called me and said, why don't you just come up here and do this for us? Well, we talked it over and we were somewhat familiar with northern Wisconsin, not necessarily in the winter, but we'd, we'd gone up there fishing in the summertime for a long time. And uh, so we elected to do that. And uh, I went up there and uh, 92. And in 96, they discovered that she had cancer and she wanted to come back to Indiana to die. And we still had our house out here in the country by Otterman. So we moved back here in October and she died mid January. So then I was living out here in the country for 10 years. Uh, I had made up my mind that I was not going, I was going to make myself available to Grand Prix if they wanted some help. Well, as it turned out, they didn't want any help from Mandy Wong, period. So uh, I just 
watch them from a distance and uh, let it kind of go with that. Did you resign from the position in Wisconsin Superior? Yes. Oh, well, I retired again, you know, so I retired three times. <laughs> once from Purdue, once from my own little outfit, and <laughs> once from University of Wisconsin Superior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you still have your house here in town? No, I oh. sold it. Okay. Uh, if she throws me out, um, I'll probably be under the Wabash Bridge. <laughs> Any uh, awards that you'd like to share with the researchers that <coughs> are honors and your, any associations that you still are you involved with any anymore? Present time. Any ideas? Well, you received a lifetime award for Bradford two years ago. Yeah, they what they set up that. Uh, First of all, it was a service, outstanding service award. Then they set up this thing where they're gonna, every five years, mm -hmm. they're gonna award it to somebody. And it's in my name, I guess. Uh, and, uh, oh, very nice. When was the first one given? A couple of years ago? Two years ago, he was <laughs> Did you know about it? That no. Oh, okay. no. They, uh, but you were, were you at the event? Yes, it was the 50th anniversary, so I was there. <laughs> so they kind of played games with me. Uh, they wanted me to assist in cutting the ribbon at the start finish line of the new track on Saturday, and nobody had so much as mentioned that. And uh, they set a president of the uh, alumni organization up in the stands to get me, drag me out on the track, so, and stuff that way. Uh, so there's, I was the Grand Marshal for Grand Prix. I was the honorary starter for Grand Prix. Most of the rest of the stuff is aging. I can hardly remember what it is. What about a um, Purdue tradition? Would you like to get one come to mind? Yeah, I'd like to hear the lions roar over here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, and in retirement activities? Uh, anything special that you're involved in? Well, right now I'm extremely involved in this alumni group. Uh, I helped found, and I think there are only two of us left living, the uh, PMO club. Uh, I wouldn't mind getting a little more involved in that. I uh, had some disagreements with Bill Luman was a dear friend, and then I don't know what happened to cause Bill Allen to fall off the wagon the way he did. And the new director I've not met, who I did go listen to the bell choir yesterday afternoon. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, when I was doing this consulting thing, I created it for a very special selfish interest. Whatever I earned in two weeks, the next two weeks I was going to spend on either hunting or fishing. And then it got out of hand. You know, and I'd never be in Stanford today and Harvard tomorrow and University of Texas the day after that. The plane was never stopping in West Lafayette. I didn't like that. so. I wasn't real sorry to see that end. I guess I've probably gotten my share, of, or maybe more than my share of awards, but for honorary honorings. Um, not one much.
to put on or gloat. That's, that's not mine. Do you still keep active in the alumni association, though, as an, an alum? Well, do they have an alumni group where you, where you live? Or? Uh, there's one in, in uh, Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing. Up. In fact, they don't even know up where. Well, we refer, we refer to them as brush wolves. <laughs> they they don't even know that there is such a thing that, that Purdue uh, exists. You know, and, uh, I figure it's just easier to let them be uneducated than it is to try to educate them. <laughs> Uh, what um, uh, any closing or other balls in your court? Would you like to do closing comments? As you look back or ahead and both? <laughs> both, yeah. Well, as it relates to Grand Prix, mm -hmm. we had a uh, during my time there. They, I hope, was my philosophy was that. We were one big family. There was no one any more or any less important in, you know, didn't care whether it was a, a driver of a cart or whether it was a person with a broom sweeping the track. As far as I was concerned and as far as the senior board was concerned, they were all important, they all had things to do. So that they became a big, big family. I think I said earlier that the senior board was numbers over 300 and I still think of them as my kids. Um, I guess my parting shot to them yesterday was uh, what I hope to see this organization become if the university is quit screwing around with us. Um, is that if you have a vision, and your vision is for one year, plant wheat. If your vision is for 10 years, plant trees. If your vision for a lifetime, plant people. And I'm hoping that maybe someplace along through my lifetime, I've planted a few people. I'm sure you have. So. Right. That's very good, and they're growing. I hope. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. You're most welcome. Appreciate that very much. This concludes the interview. Thank you.